Kendall. Hi, Bob. Welcome, everyone. Everyone's Happy doing New well, Year. are you? Yeah, doing well. Thanks, Bob. Um, we're going to get started. And as I mentioned, we're going to be recording this meeting. It's going to be posted on our uh, Detroit 2030 District YouTube channel. So um, everybody, if you'd like to introduce yourself, put your name and your organization in the chat box. Um, Feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat box as we have our uh, presenters presenting. Um, and if you don't mind during the presentations, just keeping your camera off and silencing your microphone during the presentations. Um, so we are very excited to have these three presenters today um, from Catalyst Partners and SpinView. And I'll, I'll give a little bit more description of what they're gonna be talking about when I introduce them. Um, but for now, I just wanted to give a few updates from the Detroit 2030 district, just take a few minutes um, and share a few updates. So let me go to the next slide. So just for anyone who is new to the Detroit 2030 district, you're not familiar with what we do. We are a nonprofit organization and we are working with building owners and managers in Detroit to help reduce the environmental impact from commercial buildings, construction, and transportation emissions. Um, I'm proud to say that since we uh, had our last Lunch and Learn in November that we've increased our square footage to 57 million square feet of building space in, in the city. So that's an uh, increase from uh, 52 million in November. So we continue to grow. Um, we have over 40 local businesses that sponsor us as professional stakeholders. Several are here today. Um, and we also have community stakeholders, which are um, other uh, environmental nonprofits that we collaborate with in the city. And we are actually part of a larger network. So the Detroit 2030 district is one of 24 uh, districts across North America. So this is part of a national movement. I'm inviting a few more people in here. We're part of a national movement. And many of you were uh, with us in October when we invited all of these districts to Detroit for the annual 2030 districts network summit. And we got to show off Detroit, um, had a lot of uh, great events around that. But in total, uh, the, the 2030 Districts Network has over 574 million square feet committed. So you can see here are the other uh, cities. We have three in Michigan, uh, Grand Rapids, Detroit, and Ann Arbor. And so what are we working on? What are we really aiming for? So we are working together to reduce carbon emissions in our city, carbon emissions from energy, transportation, and water associated with our buildings. Um, so we, we, are reducing, we are focused on reducing um, energy and water consumption citywide by 50% by 2030. Um, so we have a lot of programs, workshops, pilots um, to support our building members in their path to achieving that. And so who are our members? I touched on that a little bit, but we have property owners and managers that can join for free. So any building in the city of Detroit um, can join, join us at no cost. We are a free resource to them. We also have professional stakeholders, and these are businesses that support us financially um, and support our mission. Um, and we are um, grateful for over 40 professional stakeholders that we work with. And additionally, we have over 40 community stakeholders, like I mentioned, um, other nonprofits uh, in Detroit that we collaborate with. We also have three best practice practices groups. Um, that have formed, these have been really helpful for uh, building, buildings of a certain building type, similar building type um, to meet uh, quarterly and um, on topics that are relevant to that specific building type. So we have a, a venue, um, it used to be venue and museum. We now have a venue specific practice group and the museum best practices group has turned into more of a national group. Um, we also have a strong Houses of Worship best practice group and a Houses of Worship treasure hunt that Connie leads. 
and um, a multifamily best practices group as well. And just some upcoming events that I wanted to touch on briefly. So next week, if you're not familiar, we're going to have our first uh, kickoff meeting for 2023. Um, and this is going to be at the Union Carpenters and Millwrights Skilled Training Center, which many of you have probably seen off of 96 when you're heading into the city. Um, we are going to, it's from 1130 to 1. Lunch is provided. We're going to have a few exhibitor tables. We're going to have some updates from Detroit 2030 district. We're going to hear updates on some of the uh, 2023 DTE rebates. Um, we're going to hear from the the, the building, um, the Millwright Center, um, on their programming, their workforce development programs. Um, they're going to talk, speak a little bit to the the building and some of the um, green building. Um, things that they implemented in this project. And also there's gonna be an optional tour at one o'clock. Um, and lastly, we're also gonna have JLL um, there as well to present. So really looking forward to seeing people in person. Um, hope you can join. I can drop a link to the Eventbrite in, in the chat when I'm done presenting. And wanted to make sure everybody saves the date. So last year we had the first annual awards, Detroit Energy Challenge Awards Breakfast. This year it's going to be held in June again on June 15th at the Zero Net Energy Center in Corktown. Um, I also want to mention if any building in Detroit is interested in participating in this challenge, um, we encourage as many buildings that are interested to sign up. Um, if you want to compete as a finalist, you have to additionally have your data for the years 2021 and 2022 entered in Energy Star Portfolio Manager by March 3rd. We're here to support uh, building members on getting that data inputted. Um, can you still see my screen? Looks like I, I stopped sharing accidentally. No, we can't. There we go. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. So again, if you want, if there are buildings that are interested, we encourage you to sign up and then reach out to us if you need support on the data, the data and getting 2021 and 2022 data input by March 3rd. This is going to enroll you not only in the Detroit Energy Challenge, but also in the statewide competition, Michigan Battle of the Buildings. If you sign up for the challenges, um, you will uh, also get to attend the Michigan Energy Summit in Grand Rapids, um, and that is going to be held on April 18th, where the statewide biggest losers will be announced. So we would love to have as much um, representation from Detroit and see if we can get some, some more awardees from our city. And again, these are our professional stakeholders. Just want to say a big thank you to all of the businesses that support us and our mission. And lastly, if you're not familiar, like I mentioned, we have a Grand Rapids and Ann Arbor 2030 district. Um, and there is a way for you to get involved as a professional stakeholder uh, with all three districts. And um, we have several statewide professional stakeholders. But if you're interested, there's more information on our website. And then lastly, you can follow us um, on social media. And we also have um, a monthly newsletter that goes out. Um, so reach out if you can't find those things, but we'd love to get you on our list. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen while Kyle uh, shares his. And then while Kyle is sharing his his slides, I just wanted to do a brief introduction. So this is Kyle Reith from Catalyst Partners. He is the building performance team lead. Um, those not familiar with Catalyst, uh, Catalyst Partners is a consortium of sustainability focused professionals that service the construction industry. Uh, their building performance team lead, Kyle, will be highlighting efficient building technologies and discussing who Catalyst Partners is and what we do. So thank you, Kyle, for presenting. If you have questions, put them in the chat. I'll try to filter them as Kyle is going through his presentation. So thanks, Kyle. I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. 
Um, can everyone see my slides okay? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so again, I'm Kyle Reith with Catalyst Partners. I am our building performance team lead. Um, oops, there we go. Uh, my primary role at Catalyst is I, uh, I perform commissioning services um, for envelope and MEP systems, and also head up our energy modeling and energy auditing services. Uh, Catalyst Partners, is, uh, as mentioned, is a consortium of industry professionals that uh, strive to create places where all species can flourish, including our own. Um, that's kind of a motto we go by. And, uh, you know, we want to focus on the world around us and also the, the human uh, side of it as well. Um, we have 18 uh, employees within our group. Um, that are Catalyst employees, and then our consortium uh, has numerous team members uh, all around the country that we work with regularly and team up with to um, complete successful projects. A couple um, important things about Catalyst Partners is that we recently transitioned to uh, being employee owned and women led. And um, as time goes on, we hope um, that that title will transition to being uh, women owned as well. Um, we are a just 2.0 certification and we have our um, our just label there and we are also a B Corp certification and you can see our scores um, on uh, the scorecard there as well. Um, we are part of many organizations, uh, US Green Building Council, um, the uh, Well Building Institute, uh, we are a Grand Rapids 2030 district um, member and uh, the International Well Building Institute as well. Um, we do well performance verification and administration of the well rating system. Um, and then we also do reviews. Uh, so we do reviews for, um, for well certification projects, lead certification projects, and uh, you know, we're working our way into more as well. Uh, Catalyst Partners began um, when Keith Wynn uh, decided to move on from his previous career and um, you know see if he could make a bigger impact on the world. Uh, started off by helping write the uh, the guideline for um, the original uh, lead for commercial interiors, and from there we went into doing lead reviews for projects and then have grown into a company that does reviews for certification systems as well as a wide range of consulting hi keith i just wanted to interrupt briefly i wasn't okay the slide just progressed i wanted to make sure your slides were moving forward oh, okay yeah i kind of have a lot on this one <laughs> <laughs> okay um this is a majority of our team here um our team members are across the country and uh, because of that it's kind of hard for us to all get together, so we do try to do retreats every once in a while to get everyone together and uh, kind of get a better understanding of who each of us are and what we're working towards together. Uh, we offer a range of services that land into four primary buckets aside from um, our compliance services uh, for rating systems. We also have sustainability consulting, green building certification, building performance, and uh, healthy building consulting. Um, here's, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but here's just kind of a list of like what that means, um, what type of services we offer within each of those groups. Um, and one takeaway is that we, we typically focus on uh, more specialized services in support of our consortium partners that are um, that can be AE firms and uh, a lot of times we get called into projects by team members that have either worked with us in the past or just have a challenging project that has requirements they aren't as familiar with and they know that you know, we carry that familiarity and can help them get the project completed um, fairly painlessly. <laughs> so to start, I'd like to highlight our office, uh, 502 Second Street in Grand Rapids. Um, we are strong believers that leading by example is the way to go and um, showing off successes is uh, a great way to encourage others to try to follow suit. And so with our 
our home office um, in Grand Rapids, where maybe half of our, our full-time employees report to. Um, we have started off with a LEED version 2.0 uh, Platinum certification, and then um, in, uh, actually I'll go through the timeline here. Um, we started in 2010 purchasing the building and in 2012 uh, achieved the LEED Platinum version 2.0 certification. And then um, to follow through with the continuous improvement, we decided to enroll in the Consumers Energy Zero Net Energy Program um, to help us strive for a zero net energy building. Um, and then we also did the LEED version 4.0 uh, Operation and Maintenance Certification. And in 2018, we achieved uh, Platinum for LEED version 4 o and and uh, we currently are in the energy performance monitoring phase of the zero net energy program. We've completed uh, many upgrades to our building and, um, and we are excited to uh, finish that process and see where we're at officially with our performance and what's left to truly get to zero net energy. Uh, here's some images from our project. Uh, so the building layout here, we have a bore field out in our parking lot where um, our geothermal heat exchange happens. We use a geothermal heat pump in the building to serve all the spaces. Um, so we got some pictures here of the well drilling truck, which I, uh, you know, being on the building performance side of things, things like that get me excited. Um, I enjoy, you know, seeing those things that are, um, not very common to see, seeing the well drilling, seeing all the piping in the ground before it gets covered up. Um, I think that's cool. It just shows how, how it all really happens. Uh, and so we have eight wells. Um, we have eight tons of cooling and heating performance uh, with our unit. And then we have electric resistance for backup. Um, so our building has no gas connection. Uh, it's 100% electric. So that way we can achieve that zero net energy as we continue to improve. Um, the project started off by having a new uh, office space and entry vestibule uh, added onto the building uh, to provide an entryway, bathrooms, access to the various spaces, things like that. Uh, we do have an office space for our staff and a tenant space in the building. The tenant space, uh, here's a construction image in the top left of that tenant space. Um, on the roof, we started off with uh, just experimenting with solar. Uh, this was back in 2012. Um, Keith was able to source some panels that were used that someone um, you know, was trying to find a use for. And we're like, you know what? We need a sunshade. Let's get them up on our building as a sunshade and double up as also having some uh, solar production. And seeing the success successes of that, we decided to add more solar. Um, so the image in the top right is up on our rooftop. We have a five kilowatt array there, and then the one kilowatt array that acts as a, a sunshade. Um, as we went through the zero net energy program and our um, O&M certification, we uh, moved on from the original construction to continue to improve. Um, the image with the sunshade shows our existing envelope from the building that we originally just painted due to budget and lack of benefit uh, compared to where we had to put the money. Um, so we ended up living with that for as long as we could until it was apparent that it had degraded and needed to be replaced. And so we used that opportunity to install the system that's shown in the bottom right, um, which uh, our original envelope uh, did not have insulation, which is surprising, even though we were able to hit good energy performance. Um, but this system now we have uh, we have a sealed system that can prevent infiltration and exfiltration through our our block structure. Um, it includes insulation with a sealed air cavity, and um, and then got finished out around all of our our uh, our openings. And, uh, and that's been performing really well. It helped prevent a lot of the drafts and uh, temperature gradients within the building. Um, and that was completed last year. Uh, our building utilizes natural landscapes. Um, uh, we really wanted to show off just kind of the different natural landscapes around Michigan. So we have four primary biomes. We have tall grasses, 
dry prairie, woodland, and wetland. Um, and those are in different areas around the, the property. Um, and it's really interesting. Our, our building is in Grand Rapids, um, you know, just a block from the river. Um, and yet we see a lot of wildlife. Uh, we, for some reason, we always have praying mantises in our, our tall grasses in the dry prairie area. Um, every year I seem to find them. Um, and it's always fun to sit there and uh, see what else we can find. Lots of rabbits and, you know, whatever critters are in the, uh, in the neighborhood, they seem to like to migrate over to our space, um, which is always fun to watch. Um, otherwise, we don't have any, uh, any watering that needs to be done on our property because it is all natural landscape. Um, we partnered with local organizations that helped collect the seeds from trails and things locally and then help plant them. Um, and yearly, we have some of the local schools come by and, and they help do, uh, uh, do some of our landscaping and partake in, um, in the process. So the image on the left is uh, the before image. This was in 2010 when um, Catalyst Partners originally acquired the building. And the image on the right is the, the final project, at least before our envelope renovation. That um, the envelope renovation only included the dark brown paneling system. Everything else has remained the same on the on the structure. Oh, and currently with our office, we're at um, 20 kbtu per square foot uh, of consumption, and uh, that's pretty good performance. Um, so right now we're just trying to figure out where we're at after our final upgrades, which included new lighting uh, that is 100% LED now, um, adjustment of our lighting sensors, new domestic water system, um, adjustments to our energy recovery, and then the envelope. And so our goal is to eventually, once we feel we've optimized uh, our system, is to look at our solar once again and figure out now what it will take to offset the remaining budget. Um, so I'd like to go through some of our projects that we're, uh, that we're proud of and we've successfully implemented um, some sustainability features into. Uh, you know, again, we, we found that just showing successes is a great way to encourage people to try to follow suit and to start thinking about what these types of opportunities could mean for their projects or clients or their buildings. Um, overall, we've certified over 380 projects or been a part of the certification project uh, process for 380 projects, um, which is totaling over 27 million square feet of certified space. And we've also successfully delivered over $1.6 million in energy incentives um, through federal and uh, local programs. First project I'd like to highlight is the Wayne State STEM Innovation Center. Um, our role on this project was the lead administration and we were able to achieve lead version four gold certification on the project. And we also performed envelope and MEP system commissioning. Um, a couple of key features on this project. Uh, it's a seven story lab building that was a renovation of an existing structure that had no insulation. And due to the, uh, the construction type, um, it was not easy to try to add insulation and maintain the, the aesthetics that the team was looking for on the project. Um, and they ended up painting the building black, uh, which was interesting. That was something we had to run in the energy model to make sure it didn't have a big impact. And uh, surprisingly, it was quite negligible. Um, part of that because of the thermal mass of the poured concrete structure. Uh, this project originally was going for lead silver, and we were able to document enough points that got us within a very close proximity of gold. And so working with Wayne State, we reviewed the opportunity to, to reach gold and they decided they wanted to go for it. So we adjusted some of our scope um, for the project team members and we were able to successfully get gold certification, which um, you know for us was really important. This is you know this is a STEM building. There's many labs uh, throughout the building. A lot of you know the lab air flows are the driving factor, which um, 
makes it difficult when trying to reduce energy consumption and optimize systems. Um, but nonetheless, we were still able to achieve that gold certification level and have a high performing uh, lab building. And this is the entrance to the um, STEM Innovation Center. They found this skeleton in, it used to be a library, and they found the skeleton in one of the storerooms of the library. This is an elephant skeleton. Um, so thought it was really cool. Uh, some of the design team members really didn't want to see it go to waste. Um, so they ended up teaming up with the University of Michigan, who helped to restore it and reassemble it and get it put on display at the entrance of the, of the building. Um, some key energy um, systems that have really helped get the building to a high performance level are energy recovery for all the lab exhaust. Um, all that exhaust, we try to recover as much and preheat the fresh air coming into the building. We have significant amounts of airflow monitoring and measuring and building pressure measuring throughout uh, to make, make sure that we're maintaining the appropriate air changes and also resetting those air changes when possible and trying to scavenge any energy that remains in the required exhaust flow. Um, so that's a big part of it. Uh, we're also fed off of a central chiller plant in the neighboring science building. So we installed a air cooled chiller to allow for efficient cooling when that system shut down um, due to the extra loads from the lab systems. Uh, the next project I'd like to highlight is Rockford Headquarters. This project achieved LEED version 2009 Platinum certification. Um, it utilized a raised floor air distribution system and um, lots of natural lighting. On this project, we, um, we were able to have a significant impact uh, by working with the design team through the schematic design phase and early design um, development to help vet some different solutions. And I think one of our most um, impactful solutions was these roof monitors. We we're able to significantly reduce the amount of lighting fixtures installed in the building. We were able to bring in natural lighting to meet the lighting level requirements. And we were able to actually eliminate some of the passive shading techniques that we were originally considering um, to achieve adequate light levels throughout the office space. And we're able to roll all of this into significant tax rebates um, through some of the federal programs that were available um, and get some money back into the owner's pocket, as well as reducing the construction costs by having reduced lighting requirements and electrical loads in the building. The Grand Rapids Downtown Market is another one that uh, we worked on. We did um, lead certification and commissioning on that project. Um, I should mention we did the same scope on uh, Rockford headquarters, uh, aside from additional consulting services during design. Um, Grand Rapids Downtown Market achieved lead version 2009 gold certification. It utilizes a geothermal heat exchange system. Um, it has a greenhouse that is used for events and for uh, growing produce. It has kitchens available for local businesses to come in and rent space and use a professional kitchen for their small business. It has a market hall um, with various vendors that are always fun to go visit. They have great food and um, it has a really nice atmosphere. Then they have the outdoor um, the outdoor market for uh, farmers markets and they have other community events there as well. Gordon Food Headquarters is another one um, that we worked on. We did the uh, LEED certification and achieved LEED version 2009 silver certification. Um, we also did commissioning on that. Um, this was one of the projects I commissioned myself uh, with other team members. And this uses a large geothermal bore field um, it, it, uh, it actually ended up exceeding the energy model expectations by 30% once in operation, which was, um, which was just a huge surprise. I think to a lot of us, uh, the building was much more efficient than we even expected it to be. Uh, it uses some neat technologies that, um, are coming around. This building was built roughly 10 years ago and, uh, it utilized heat recovery chillers, the geothermal bore field. Uh, heat pump air handling units and um, it utilized a green sleeves 
uh, pumping skid and control system to uh, maintain the bore field um, health. And uh, all those came together to create a really nice work environment for the staff and to um, optimize its energy use at the same time. See, I'm running low on time here. So I'm gonna just try to finish up a couple more. Uh, Lake Michigan College, we went to this site. They had high demand charges and high energy consumption and also high maintenance costs because they were uh, feeding water to and from this pond that surrounds the buildings. And we were working on a performing arts center that has peaky loads and um, again, led to high demand charges. So we worked with them to vet new systems that were degrading anyway. And we, um, we worked with them to commission after it was installed the air cooled chiller uh, ice storage system and then high efficiency boilers um, and this was able to significantly shift their electrical loads from on peak to off peak times um, where it's significantly cheaper. Uh, the Burback residence is a living building challenge project. Um, this is a uh, the second residence in the world to achieve living building challenge certification uh, utilizes solar it has responsibly sourced materials um, it it adds to the environment it was built on uh, versus taking from uh, it uses a lot of different technologies to make sure that the energy isn't wasted and always being recycled um, and overall it was just a really beautiful project um, it's one that we're all very proud of the John Ball Zoo meerkat habitat was one that achieved sites gold certification and it is the first zoo in the country to achieve site certification. Um, and then also at John Ball Zoo we're currently finishing up the pygmy hippo habitat where uh, we're doing living building challenge petal certification and we're also doing commissioning services and it's a zero net energy project with consumers energy. Uh, they have solar they have geothermal um, and we are working diligently to get it ready for the animals that arrive in February. And the last one I'd like to mention um, is a well platinum project for a local um, healthcare manufacturer. And they achieve a well version two pilot platinum certification with 82 points. Um, here's the scorecard. They are able to get 100% of the mind movement and community points. Um, and that project overall is just, uh, it's, it's really fun to be a part of. It's a great working environment and a, a great place to visit with a very um, healthy space for the employees uh, to occupy. Okay, uh, I think I'm about out of time. Uh, so that's all I have for today. Um, I hope that these projects were um, something that spoke to you and, and kind of got you thinking about different opportunities for projects you're working on and ways that you can incorporate energy efficiency and high performance into um, also beautiful and functional facilities. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, your presentation was really, all those projects are really inspiring. And like I said in the chat, the designs are really beautiful as well. Um, well, we, um, I wanna make sure we have time for the second presenter, but we do have, there were four questions in the chat if you don't mind, Kyle, would you do you mind um, responding to some of those questions? And, and we may get the chance uh, to get to them at the end of the second presentation as well. Uh, yeah. And um, I'm going to now introduce our uh, thank you, Kyle, next presenter. Um, and while they're pulling up their slides, I'm just going to uh, read a description of what they're going to be presenting on. But I, I want to introduce Eric Tams from SpinView North America. He's the business development manager and Phil Damati, who is the national sales manager. Um, and SpinView is going to be presenting an overview of the digital twin concept and how it can be used for sustainability, reducing carbon emissions and getting to net zero by 2030. Um, for those not familiar, a digi digital twin is a virtual representation of a real world region, city, building, system, or physical asset, whereby you can run simulations, analyze data, perform maintenance, optimize resources allocation, decarbonize, meet ESG goals, or get to net zero emissions. Um, real world use cases will be discussed along with examples of projects that have been done over the years. So welcome SpinView and Eric, I'll turn it over to you. 
Yeah, good, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, before I turn it over to Phil, who's actually gonna run through the slide deck, I just wanna thank um, Kendall and Connie and Detroit 2030 for putting this together. It's a, I'm looking here, I think we have 21 participants and that's fantastic. So um, thank you guys for hosting us today. And uh, in a matter of interest and time, I'm just gonna turn it over to Phil. So Phil, take it away. Hello everyone, Phil Damati here. Uh, just to give you a brief background on me, I've been in the BIM to FM digital twin world now for about 13 years. BIM to FM or BIM for facilities management um, is the precursor to digital twin technology. Um, back in the day, we were asked, and I did one of the first BIM to FM uh, projects in the, in the US back at the time. Uh, we had a company come to us and say, here's our models, here's our data, here's our paper documents, do something with it. We want to be able to, you know, point and click. And that's that was the very first project we did. Um, and that goes back about 13 years ago. So I'm going to go into a couple of things about Digital Twin and what it is. Then I'm going to show you some examples. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you examples all along the way. But if you have any questions, just uh, type them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. So with that. Uh, just to give you an idea about some of our clients, uh, in the U.S., on the, on the left-hand side, we focus mainly on buildings and doing digital twins of buildings and diving into the data uh, on that respect. And on the right-hand side, our U.K. partners have a lot of experience on infrastructure and working on large-scale projects where you know uh, they want to visualize uh, the infrastructure of a city, uh, a region. Etc. So, um, if you look at what a digital twin is, and just to give you an example of what a citywide digital twin is, um, as Kendall said, it's a virtual representation of a, a, a real world region, city, uh, infrastructure, a building, a system, whatever it is that you have that you want to do something with and analyze data, that's what a digital twin can be. And in this example, it's showing the overlay of the city and then converting it to a digital format so we can be able to do things with that particular city. Um, and if you look at, uh, on a different respect, what a digital twin is for digital infrastructure, it's taking that you know, same information about a city that may be hard to understand. Uh, we're talking about uh, the the, uh, the drawings, underground drawings of the infrastructure, utilities, water, et cetera, and then being able to convert that into something that is more understandable, a 3D virtualization or visualization. Uh, as we go further down the line, we're, we're gonna drill into a building. What is the, the digital twin on, on a building level? Well, that is looking at the entire building, including all the building systems and the assets and looking at that and being able to drill down, analyze, perform uh, preventive maintenance, work order management, IOT sensor analysis. And the whole goal here with all of this is to decarbonize, right? To get to your net zero goals. And we're, we make it easier for you to do that, right? You, know, you can do cost studies, you can hire consultants, you can have people come in and, and that's all fantastic. But if you can't visualize what you wanna do, it makes it a little difficult um, in, in the long run. And also to be able to get that information as a point and click method uh, and be able to create a baseline of your data, which is important. I'll always emphasize the data portion of this um, is probably more important than the visualization, but the visualization helps, right? So we're showing this as um, you know, building in, in, a, in a virtual 3D world, but the data underlying what's, what's in that building is most important. Here's an example of a digital twin on a, on a system level, being able to, you know, again, understand, we saw that city infrastructure level, it was very difficult to understand. And so is on a building level, taking these 2D PDFs and trying to understand what everything means is a little bit difficult. But if we can take that information and virtualize it and visualize, visualize it in 3D, now it becomes a little bit more uh, understandable and we can work with that data. It, and on an asset level, it doesn't necessarily have to be a mechanical asset or something um, that is, um, you know, on a mechanical level. 
it, or a building level, infrastructure level, it could be, and in this particular case, a cemetery. They wanted to visualize and, and digitize the asset data behind what's going on in this particular cemetery. The current method in this particular case was uh, someone would walk up to the door and say, I'd like to find the, the stone of my loved one. And it would take them 25 minutes to an hour to find where it was located uh, going through paper records. Uh, the, the idea here is to digitize that information and being able to do that will allow us to do other things with the data, such as put it on a kiosk. So when they drive up, all they have to do is type in the name it will show them directions to where they wanna go. And in this case, they also wanted to do QR code where you can download an app and then it would actually be attached to a, an application like Waze and take you directly to the tombstone. So different ways to use this, not necessarily net zero, but I wanted to show you the different ways that people actually use digital twins. Um, as far as the digital twin research is concerned, it has been estimated that the savings on an urban level can be anywhere from three to five dollars a square foot uh, by using digital twin technology. That's a huge number, right? On a building level, so we're going to talk about that now. What is that on? What is BIM for digital twin to FM? Um, and taking all of the data associated on a building level for a particular project, whether it be new construction or an existing building, and being able to digitize that information and put it into a system where we can visualize all those assets is very important. And in that case, just eliminating the data silos of all the different disparate information and being able to have one digital database, one source of truth, in just that one area eliminates 25 cents a square foot in savings, right? So that disparate uh, information is eliminated, you save 25 cents a square foot. And that can add over the course of the lifetime of the building, which could be anywhere from 30 to 40 years, maybe even longer. So in that case, the, the, the savings are every year 25 cents a square foot. Now, drilling down into it, you can actually find different uh, ways to save and, and get to net zero, right? Um, and the, the cost not only jumps from 25 cents a square foot, but it can range anywhere from $1.80 to $5 a square foot by using a digital twin for sustainability at zero goals, decarbonization. <clears throat> so uh, looking at it from a point of view, what are the, the benefits of a digital twin to get to net zero? The obvious one is energy optimization and reduction, right? That's what everyone talks about. I want to connect my IoT sensors. I want to be able to control them. I want to see when someone's in a room and or not in a room do i turn off the lights can i remote control those those lights you know that that is the obvious one but there's so many different ways to save money and to be able to decarbonize um of course you know it, uh, having lead certification um and being able to use the digital twin to track your goals and getting to lead certification is one way reduction of greenhouse gases um it also, retrofit analysis is huge in, in the market today. How do I you know, uh, look at what kind of equipment I have when the end of life is coming? And when uh, I take that, can I, that information, can I say to myself, okay, now uh, I wanna replace all this, this data and I wanna replace all these assets. What is the best way to do that? And to do those analyses, you need, also need to do simulations. You know, if I replace the, the glass on my building with more energy efficient glazing, what is my cost to benefit ratio on there? And to do that, you want to hire a consultant. You can actually take the data from your building, put it into a database, create visualizations, and actually run simulations on it. So, as, and there's a lot of other uh, benefits, such as, um, it, uh, like I said, simulations, but air quality improvement is also big too. So if I want to, you know, create a baseline of my volatile organic compounds in my building, what I could do is map that on a building and go through programs to reduce those emissions and those gases. And then I can do another uh, mapping to see where I've, where I, my baseline was and now where I am in my goal to get to net zero.
and I'll show you an example of that. But I also wanted to show you the digital twin roadmap that we go through. It's not just a matter of like back in the old days, here's my, my data and you, we throw the data at you and spin view, go ahead and create a digital twin. No, that's not the way it really works. Uh, in today's market, we have to actually have to do what's called a digital twin assessment. We're gonna look at the building owner or region owner, county, whatever it may be, city owner, uh, the city planners. We're gonna look at their information. We're gonna document all that information. And we're gonna say, okay, this is the way it is. This is what you have. This is what you wanna have as far as the digital twin is, is concerned, how you wanna visualize it. We're gonna document all that information, put it in um, a document that everyone is gonna agree on. Sign off on it. Yes, this is what I want. This is what data looks like. This is you know, my IoT sensors, my building automation systems, my building management systems. And we're gonna have everyone agree to the roadmap. Because without that roadmap and without the good data, you cannot ever get to a digital plan. And then what we're gonna do on the second phase is actually prepare that those models of data, if there are any, if there aren't any models, we can create them. If you wanna have 2D representations, we can do that as well. And then we take that and we prepare that for the eventual aggregation and visualization. How do you wanna visualize it? Well, that goes back to the digital twin assessment. We're gonna follow that plan. We're gonna aggregate and visualize whether you wanna see system data, you wanna see asset data, you wanna see um, you know, whatever it may be, air quality data, we, we will map that to what your needs are. And then the fourth step is actually connecting IoT sensors. And this is an important step. You know, that's what everyone wants to get to first, but if you don't have a baseline of data to begin with in, in, in number one, you can't get to number four because number four is just a readout, right? But you wanna be able to compare IoT sensor data to your actual baseline building data. And that's the first step in getting to a digital twin but the fourth step in the, in the whole process, right? So before number four, well, all we had was visualization of your data. And now we're actually getting to a point where we're gonna to start to analyze. And then the fifth, in the fifth uh, you know, a part of this plan is to actually start the simulation process. We're gonna analyze the data, we're gonna simulate, we're gonna create scenarios where we can save money. And that's the goal in this whole process is to decarbonize, reduce emissions and get to net zero faster than you could if you were just looking at your building and saying, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Uh, so the, um, the idea is digit digital information is to digitize the information by having one click building asset data. I'm gonna click on something, I'm gonna search for something, up pops my, my record, and then I can drill down into the data. Show me the attributes, show me the warranty information, show me you know, what my energy consumption is if I'm connecting to utility information. So we can do all that in 2D and we can also do that in 3D and I'll show you some examples in a moment. Um, also digital environmental monitoring is becoming more and more popular these days. Creating a baseline, like I mentioned before, of your volatile organic compounds that are happening inside your building and then being able to map that where these gases are coming from. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to always be inside the building. I had someone ask me, well, can I put sensors on the outside of the building to monitor what's going on with the construction project next door because we're having a lot of health concerns inside our building and you wanna see where it's coming from. So you can certainly do inside and outside as well. So one of the things that we do in visualization is create 3D building point, viewpoints. We don't want someone log, walking around like an Xbox game, getting lost and taking four hours to get somewhere. What we wanna do is create simple, easy to use viewpoints where someone can point and click and go into a particular space. From this space, then they can start to walk around, click on objects, get information, get data, get uh, any kind of videos, pictures, submittal data, any kind of um, warranty data. It's all point and click. And I've done studies where I've sat into, um, I'll give you an example of Disney. I sat in a ride queue, Little Mermaid ride queue as the, the building was being built. And we took all the information, put it into, at the time, the technology was called BIM to FM. Um, and we put it in there as a visualization. 
and we connected to the work order management system. And I said, as we were standing around talking to all of the uh, technicians who were early in the morning, eating their bagel, drinking the coffee, they didn't want to hear this. They didn't hear and want to hear another technology. Uh, and I said, can anyone tell me what that light fixture is 20 feet above my head? Everyone looked at me like I was crazy. Well, no, we don't know what that is. I mean, we don't know the model, make, manufacturer. We have to go back to the, uh, the, the office. We have to open up a book. We have to look through some paper documents, and then we can tell you. I said, well, how long is that going to take? And they said, well, it's going to take about 25 minutes. Okay. What if I showed you, I said to them, I can point and click and show you that on this device in five seconds. They all left. They, they thought I was crazy. So I, I quickly went to the ride queue. I clicked on the light and I showed it within five seconds. They couldn't, um, they were in amazement. They couldn't believe. And that's just a visualization. So uh, that is just taking the data, visualizing it, digitizing it, being able to recall it within seconds. Save them 25 minutes per work order right there off the bat. So that is huge when it comes to actually reducing waste as well and being able to, to gather the information within seconds. And this help, all helps towards getting towards net zero is being able to digitize the information so we could use it later on for the actual greening of the building and being able to uh, decarbonize. Here's an example of 2D plans recalling information. Point and click, up point, uh, pops the information. Um, like I said, here's a digital work order that we can do from only 2D. I haven't really got into 3D yet, but we can create uh, work orders on a map, being able to zoom in, click on anything on this map uh, to get information, and then actually create work orders as well. Um, it's not limited to actual assets. You can do space management as well. You know, it is, you know, what are the IoT sensors coming off of this particular space? What are my uh, indoor air quality sensors reading? How much does it, uh, how many, many square feet do I have it here because I've got to repaint the floor? And it will save time and effort and the amount of uh, paint that you have to buy. So uh, going into a couple of different things, but uh, we can also digitize systems and look at system data. And as we're digitizing the system, since we have it all digitized and 3D, we can actually start to parse out the data. I just want to see my exhaust air and my return air. Click on those two buttons and be able to isolate those systems for work order management, for uh, energy efficiency, for, for whatever you needed to use it for as far as net zero and carbon reduction. And here's an example of uh, clicking on an asset and getting BAS sensor information right on the asset itself. Now we're not getting all the data points coming off of it, but we're getting the important ones that the facilities technician wants to see. How we can even control it from the field if that was something that they wanted to do. I can tell you that building automation system companies don't like that. They will yell at you. They will, they will make you feel like you cannot do that, but you can do this. And it's something that if a letter is written to the building automation system companies and the right people have the right credentials to get and change settings, you can certainly do that in, in a digital 3D atmosphere. Here's another example of digitizing asset data and, and building automation system, systems for a room instead of an entire system. So in this particular operating room, looking at it, we're being able to control the dials, control the airflows, and being able to diagnose if there's any problems and uh, and also control this for comfort management as well. On a larger scale, you can certainly digitize assets and entire cities if you needed to. Now that depends on how many building owners are gonna join your program, but you can also have an overview of the entire city, like in this case, where uh, this particular municipality wanted to put sensors on each corner and we wanted to drill into those sensors to all be able to use that for a number of different reasons uh, as far as air quality control um, and how would they do that in the city? Well, uh, they, they wanna be able to simulate the number of cars that go by, the actual number of cars, and then wanna simulate what happens if we reduce the amount of carbon emitting cars within the city by offering incentives and uh, replace them with electrical vehicles. 
in that case, uh, the digital twin can say, okay, we're gonna put all this information into the system. And then we're gonna spit out a number that's gonna show you your return on investment here, because we're gonna to have to buy more electricity to, um, to offset the amount of uh, vehicles, carbon emitting vehicles. And, but we're also in, gonna increase air quality. And what is that gonna do? We can map that out on the digital twin and we can show it virtually before we actually even offer an incentive program if we're a city planner and or, or we're an energy or utility company. We can actually map this out beforehand, saving time and effort. And here's an example of drilling down into that large scale visualization data. We're able to capture video feeds and all the sensor data is coming off the pole and we can map them out and show them in graphical form if we wanted to. And then from here, we can take it and say, okay, now I wanna overlay my electrical vehicles and I also want to see if I reduce the amount of carbon emitting vehicles, what does it do for my air quality? We can map that out. Here's an example of doing digital twin simulation on a large scale. Uh, we did this for the city of Las Vegas as a visualization, showing them uh, what their air quality would be on any particular day based on the amount of traffic that goes by, or the, the, the weather patterns, anything can be visualized. Uh, here is an example of digital twin decision making. Uh, I'm going to show my lead efficient buildings in green. I'm going to show my energy hogs in red. And then we're going to go to the building owners and we're going to say, hey, look, you know, we're going to need to see uh, if there's any way we can do retrofit of this building. We're going to offer you incentives to do so in, in an effort to green this city. Again, this was the city of Las Vegas. Hey, Phil, I yes. just wanted to. Uh, interrupt briefly. We're almost at the one o'clock mark, and I think um, some of the questions uh, Eric was able to answer in the chat, but I just wanted to acknowledge it's almost one o'clock. Um, I'm able to stay on a little bit longer if others are, so you can finish your, your slides, but um, I know a few people might have to, to uh, hop off. This was the last slide. Oh, <laughs> my timing was right on. Okay. Yeah, so you can take the, the, uh, the digital twin for facilities management and start to um, green your building and also be able to look at all the systems uh and there's a lot lot more to just uh net zero here uh you can do work order management preventive maintenance etc so um and that's the last slide showing you know the analysis portion where we're looking at the spaces where we're turning things off and on we're uh, doing analyzation and we're doing optimization and that was it. Thank you, Phil. That was great. Um, lots of good information. We're really excited um, that SpinView um, is working with us in Detroit um, and maybe looking to do a couple of digital twin pilots. Um, I know you put your contact info here, um, but if you and Eric and, and Kyle, um, if you'd like, drop your email address in the chat for everyone to follow up with any questions. You can always reach out to myself or Connie as well, and we can connect you with our speakers. Um, but thank you, everyone. Thanks for the great presentations, lots of good questions, lots of things going back and forth in the chat. Um, I did put a couple of links in the chat um, as well. So uh, to our meeting for our meeting next Friday for the Detroit Energy Challenge and an article about about SpinView. So I'm going to stop recording if anybody wants to stay on, if there's any other updates for the group or if you need to head out. Um, have a great weekend.